There was one thing that Flint Dibbles said on his debate with Graham Hancock on the Joe Rogan experience that pretty much everybody can tell was just off. And that was the part about the three million shipwrecks. We can think about shipwrecks, right? Graham has mentioned that the bulk of marine archaeology has focused on shipwrecks and not the continental shelves. And so the thing is, at this point, we have something like three million shipwrecks from around the world. Obviously, the vast majority of these are going to be from recent times. I mean, there was this little thing known as World War II that happened that I think one or two boats might have been sunk during. But Flint uses this whole thing to jump off into claims about boats that are directly related to Hancock's lost civilization. And so one of my questions for Graham is if this is a global civilization with ships, why is it that we don't have shipwrecks from this global civilization? I see this as a big, big problem. If we're looking for an, a, a civilization that's traversing the oceans, we should find these shipwrecks. And, and he proceeds to make quite the case, one that we're going to go over in detail, and we'll see if he inflates the abilities of science or the knowledge that science has, like he did the numbers of shipwrecks there. So grab yourself a cold one and sit down. Hi, I'm Dan and welcome to Dunking. Joe did a great job moderating the event, and one example of this is the way that he would press issues and ask questions repeatedly until at least he felt that the issue was resolved. And he did that with Flint on the shipwrecks, and the result was Flint saying this. There's this idea that things just decay the older they are, and that's really not true. It depends on the burial environment that they're in. So the taphonomy is what archaeologists use to study how things survive and how they are there. Mm -hmm. And so typically when things are buried, they're very stable. Or when they're, you know, sitting, it depends on where you are on the bottom of the ocean. But typically it's very, very stable. Taphonomy is indeed the science of how things survive in the record, and there have been many studies that are done on marine taphonomy itself. We will focus on wood for the purposes of this video, as boats made of wood are the most common in the historical record, and would be the most likely candidate to have been used as a construction material for the ships of Graham Hancock's lost civilization. Wood is hands down the most common boat building material of all time, and was still the most common until about 150 years ago, even in our advanced western cultures. Now Flint tells us that. Would it stay that way for 20,000 years, you think? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's this idea that things just decay the older they are, and that's really not true. It depends on the burial environment that they're in. And the environment part is right. The rate of decomposition absolutely does depend on the environment. But he also says the idea things decay faster the older they are isn't true. And you got to compare that with what we find in a paper titled Wood Taphonomy in a Tropical Marine Carbonate Environment, Experimental Results from Lee Stocking Island, the Bahamas, in which it says, Duration of exposure, depositional setting, and the amount and continuity of burial all contribute to the amount of Limnoria attack on the surface of the wood. Limnoria is one of several wood-boring parasites on the ocean floor. You can see what they found after just two years underwater. This piece of wood is two centimeters across and it looks like Swiss cheese. These are microbes, by the way. This isn't the only wood boring thing in the region. The paper discusses the slow disintegration of wood. Several types of wood, mind you, over the course of just two years, they track significant loss of both volume and mass due to these things eating them. Obviously, this stands in stark contrast to the comment that Flint made. There's this idea that things just decay the older they are, and that's really not true. Which, to be fair, may be from Flint's experience as a terrestrial archaeologist, and this is marine taphonomy, and he does conflate them. So the taphonomy is what archaeologists use to study how things survive and how they are there. Mm -hmm. And so typically when things are buried, they're very stable. Or when they're, you know, sitting, it depends on where you are on the bottom of the ocean. So perhaps that's where his confusion is coming from. But like he said, the environment is crucial, and basically it's the determining factor as to whether or not wood or other organic material survives long periods of time in the ocean. Which means what you're probably thinking is correct. When Joe spoke about the endurance and its amazing state of preservation, it was due to the environment. Specifically, the endurance sank in icy cold Antarctic waters. To quote the British historian Dan Snow, it's probably below zero. There's no wood-eating microbes and microorganisms damaging the vessel. Now, I think everybody watching realizes that the longer it's on the ocean floor, the longer it's going to be eaten by those microbes. So when Flint says that the ocean floor is relatively stable, that really stands in stark contrast to the expert opinion. The consensus among scientists working directly in the field seems to be best summed up by award-winning science journalist Kit Chapman writing for the Royal Society for Chemistry. The state of a shipwreck depends on a host of factors how long it's been underwater, the materials it's made from, the depth, temperature and currents of water, whether it's sank or fresh in salt water. 
These factors also affect the kind of creatures that will try to make the wreck their home and that are responsible for most of the damage and degradation. The endurance was so well preserved because the microorganisms that typically devour a wooden wreck do not live in the cold, hostile waters of the Antarctic. So the statement that is typically stable is flat out wrong. If you're a piece of wood, the ocean floor is a hellhole of things eating Swiss cheese and stuff like that to you. And if it's cold, you're in better shape. And there's other factors that can apply as well. If, if you're buried with silt, you could be in better shape. Or if the salinity is really high or something like that. There's a number of different things that can play into this. But one of the ones that does play in almost everywhere is chemical equilibrium or like homeostasis. So in general, wood will decay. So, you know, in a lot of underwater environments, it'll just preserve as long as it's in homeostasis. This is basically the chemical balance between the object and its surroundings. Once it chemically doesn't stand out, it's not really food or whatever for the other critters. And at this point, barnacles and the like will usually cover the object, which then will cover the ship in concretions, they're called. They're hard, mineral-rich layers that serve as a sort of armor. This will protect the shipwreck from further predation. Even the current has trouble penetrating the rigid skin that the barnacles leave behind. This leaves these weird casts of the vessel, the ship's mostly gone with just little that remains is covered in hard minerals. You've seen these sort of images before. And once this has occurred, the ship can last for a long time in this state, but not forever. Eventually, the wood, because it's hollowed out, will collapse under the weight of the concretions and the ship will be lost. This is why most shipwrecks, even ones that are considered generally well-preserved, are more or less piles of debris. Hey, Flint talks about one where the nets are intact, and this shipwreck is considered to be very intact. I mean, the preservation underwater is amazing. There's this shipwreck off the coast of Italy that I just presented uh, what was on the Bad Boy of Science YouTube about, about shipwrecks and stuff, and there's still the vine netting that was holding the, the Roman cargo was still preserved. Wow. I mean, it is well preserved, but it's also a complete wreck. At 2,000 years old, the state of preservation is pretty remarkable. But it covered in mud immediately upon sinking, and like a fossil, the situation that allowed for this to happen is very unique. Also, like the fossil record, we know we only get a tiny fraction of a percent of what actually has happened in the record. And despite Flint's claims otherwise, time is definitely a factor on how long something will survive on the ocean floor. I mean, there's places like the Black Sea that have some remarkably well-preserved shipwrecks there, but that's due to the higher salinity and the lack of things eating them. And they still eventually collapse and crumble and fall to crap. And that's not part of the world's oceans anyway, so it doesn't even really count when we're looking at Graham Hancock's lost civilization. The way Flint uses a hole in the record to disprove Hancock reminds me of a creationist asking where the missing link is. Flint is well aware the record is spotty, but he wants to use that lack of something being in it as proof that it doesn't exist. But he's not even thinking his position through, at least not how it relates to Hancock's. Flint has told us why things get preserved, and I've made sure you, the viewer, know the basics of what he said and how the science works. Equilibrium with the environment, covered in mud or silt, encased in barnacles and their mineral-rich secretions, or extreme circumstances like cold or high salinity are what it takes to preserve a shipwreck. All these conditions rely on stability, the water staying the same temperature, the currents flowing the same, the silt covering the ship consistently. But Hancock's proposed lost civilization was said to have been wiped out by a flood, the oceans of the world causing the destruction on the land. Now, of course, this is contentious. There's a lot of debates about it. The Younger Dryas impact hypothesis and all of that, and there's two very distinct camps fighting about it. And since we have that going on, we well, can be pretty certain that this debate won't be resolved like, satisfactorily anytime soon. But what we do know is that the Younger Dryas was a time of extreme climate change in the record. Nobody's going to argue that. And it also changed the sediment layers in the ocean, and it changed the Gulf Stream in the ocean. It changed shit in the ocean a lot. In the following quote from the 2015 paper, The Role of the Gulf Stream in the European Climate, they discuss the changes to the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, a part of the Gulf Stream that is responsible for carrying warm water from the tropics to Europe. Myriad proxies from sediment cores suggest that variations in Gulf Stream transport are coincident with swings in European climate over the past 15,000 years. For example, protactinium-231 and thorium-230 ratios suggest that the rate of the North Atlantic deep water export in the tr deep branch of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation AMOC, was reduced during the Younger Dryas cooling implying an equal reduction in mass flux of the shallow branch of the AMOC. Oxygen isotopes of benthic foraminifera, a type of protozoa, straddling the Gulf Stream on either side of the Florida Straits 
are consistent with a smaller temperature contrast across the straits during the Younger Dryas, which is interpreted as a reduced density gradient and a smaller geostrophic Gulf Stream transport. This reduced geostrophic Gulf Stream transport could be associated with a slowdown in either the AMOC or wind-driven components of the Gulf Stream. Nutrient proxies with carbon isotopes and cadmium suggest that during the Younger Dryas, the deep North Atlantic was filled with high nutrient waters, an indicator that this area of the ocean was more sluggishly ventilated and thus the AMOC transport was reduced. Now there's a lot of words there and there's a lot to unpack in what the whole Gulf Stream and everything that happened to the Younger Dryas, and that's really outside the scope of this video, but what's important to take note of is that science is very clear that during the time that would have been the destruction of Graham Hancock's lost civilization, the oceans were tumultuous, things were under a lot of change, so all of the conditions that Flint describes would have potentially been under heavy fire. Things underwater were moving around. The Gulf Stream changed. If it was in cold water, it may well find itself getting hammered with warm water for a minute. If it had been buried with silt, it may find itself uncovered with silt. It, it was a rough time to be in the seas, and Flint's well aware of this. And if he really thought about this with like an open mind and was trying to have a, a fair conversation instead of debunk Hancock, he, he would have known that this was the case and that his point was, wasn't really going to get very far. But he, again, he, he kind of had blinders on through this whole thing. He kind of had like a little bit of a double standard thing going on and stuff. And my next point will show that kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, to those people, there, some people might argue with me. Uh, my final point, you can't really argue with it as far as I'm concerned. It definitely shows pretty clear double standard. Now, Joe does mention the notion of water moving sediment off the wrecks and exposing them to predation again. Pay close attention to how Flint words this. Now, what about the shifting of sediment at the bottom of the ocean when you're dealing with things like 10, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago? Yeah, so that there's actually, I was just talking with uh, Jessica Cook-Hale out of Bradford about this. And actually, so she's done some studies off the coast of Florida of sort of hurricanes that are coming in today because to she's excavating Stone Age shell mounds there. And it turns out, actually, that the hurricanes coming in today really don't disturb them much at all. He answers a question about the sediment shifting in general with a specific answer that only applies to hurricanes and other surface activities. As I showed in the paper just a second ago, the Gulf Stream changes. This concept is simple. Glaciers melt or other increasing waters flow causes more sediment to end up in the sea. Shifting currents changes the sediment on things that were long covered. This is covered in extreme detail in a couple of papers that I'll link below. Post-glacial flooding of the Bering Land Bridge dated to 11,000 before present based on new geophysical and sediment records and rapid oceanic and atmospheric changes during the Younger Dryas Cold Period. The clearest, easiest quote that I can give you from a legit scientific paper comes from the sedimentary system response to the global sea level in the East China Sea since the last glacial maxim. Maximum. The abstract says, The East China Seas, ECS, is one of the world's largest continental shelf seas. Based on the combination of global sea level changes and sequence stratigraphy, we systematically investigated the evolution of sedimentary system in the ECS since the last glacial maximum, LGM. We have defined the transgressive boundary layer and constructed several sedimentary models of the ECS on the sequence stratigraphy and evolution of tidal sand ridges since the LGM and sediment source to sink during the high sea level. The result shows that the ECS represents a typical case for the large-scale continental shelf response to global sea level change. Three sedimentary system tracks have been formed in the ECS since the LGM. First is a low stand system tract corresponding to the late of the last glaciation in LGM. The progressive wedge occurred along the Okinawa trough slope and the Paleo-Coastal Zone along the continental shelf edge. Second is a transgressive system tract that corresponds to the last deglaciation. A large-scale transgressive boundary layer and tidal sand ridges were formed in this stage. Third is the high stand system tract corresponding to the high sea level. Notice they say this is a typical case. They have three different types of changes in the way that the sediments laid on the ocean floor right there on the continental shelf where all the sea shipwrecks and stuff happen, right? Three different types when the sea level rise, and this is typical. I mean, I, I could belabor this point for a minute, but I think what's important to point out here is that when Flint spoke about surface level activity like hurricanes, he's not really taking into account the things that Hancock would definitely posit, which would be a flood, which would definitely change the way things are as science knows. So that was, again, he just kind of dodged the issue there. He's, it, it seems like a heavy double standard here, or at the very least, like just seriously not thinking things through. 
Because sediment isn't stable after a flood, neither is temperature. And that's why the oldest boat that we have found is from a bog, it's not from the ocean. Bogs are an environment that stays considerably more stable than the open seas do. The boat is called the Pesce Canoe and it's about nine or 10,000 years old. Now when you go back into Roman times and before, there's actually very little in the record, not very much at all in the way of shipwrecks. But we do have some signs of boats being used long before then even. The Gobastan rock art shows a ship and it's about 20,000 years old. On the Isle of Wight, a prehistoric boat building site was discovered in 2005. The director of the Maritime Archaeological Trust, Gary Member, had this to say about the site. The site contains a wealth of evidence for technological skills that were not thought to have been developed for a further couple thousand of years, such as advanced woodworking. This site shows the value of marine archaeology for understanding the development of civilization. Now there's other evidence too that people in Southeast Asia that happened like hundreds of thousands of years ago and you know there's, there's all kinds of little things like that that are, exist all over the world. Even They think even Neanderthals had boats at this point. And you're probably wondering why would Dan bring up Neanderthals having boats in this video? Well there's a strong reason that goes to that second thing I was going to tell you as to like the double standards or the just the blinders however you want to look at it. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years of people having used boats. They traveled around the globe doing all kinds of stuff, at least tens of thousands of years. Yet we have no boat in the record from the time from 10,000 BC all the way back. We have that canoe as the oldest one. So Flint accepts that they people were using boats 20,000 years ago. I mean, I assume he does. I don't see him in anybody's videos like Stefan Milo's video yelling at him about it. I don't see anything like that. What I do see is him saying that no matter how long something's underwater, it should be okay. So if we're talking hundreds of thousands of years of people using boats, even if they were just, you know, regular old small wooden craft, according to Flint's metrics, we should have tons of them in the water. They should be all over the damn place, on the continental shelves where they look. There should be tons of these ancient ships. We should at least find them. But we don't. That doesn't change Flint's opinion on whether or not they existed. But when we're talking about Hancock's boats, all of a sudden, I see this as a big, big problem. Now, and he's not alone here. This debate's being held up as this big win for team science, and, and it's too bad because a lot of the science was misrepresented to the point that I could be making videos about this for months. Which, which I won't do that, so, so that's not a threat, but I will be covering it in a few more videos, and I definitely want to talk at least one about just kind of the overarching strategy, social, freaking psychological things that come out of this whole mess because... I, th I think that people are missing the boat pretty heavily on that so far. A handful of people see it, but nobody on the YouTube so far. And anyway, I like to tell you guys what I think. So you're going to get that coming down the pipes too. But I also am going to have to, you know, criticize where Hancock got, went wrong at some point in this thing too, which we'll be doing. But right now, the way that Flint's um, scientific arguments is being touted is so awesome. I kind of feel like I have to address those first because a lot of the science there is, is just... Three million shipwrecks. Come on, man. It's so blatantly, like, so blatantly transparent that it's it's got all of his buddies going, yeah, but the people on the fence or the people that were Hancock believers, he ain't really slain very many. I know that we have some people commenting to the contrary on that, and you know, we'll talk about that in the future video, but <laughs> whatever. It's very easy to tell when a scientist is not speaking scientifically and is getting kind of emotional. When they're speaking scientifically, you'll hear things like the data strongly indicates, we're inclined to believe, yada, yada, yada. But when you start hearing them say things like, we know for certain, or we can definitely prove, at that point, you should know that you're not talking to a scientist anymore. You're talking to the person that wears the lab coat, but he's not really wearing the lab coat at that time. Have a good day. And I'd say we could definitively prove there was no 